Now, spiders are indeed part of the great biodiversity. Oh, you'd think I would have practiced this before I started. There we go. Um, one of the great biodiversity groups in the world, one of the great biodiverse groups in the world. And by this we mean that there are many, many different sorts of species. Now spiders belong to a class called the class Arachnida. Arachnida is named after a Greek goddess called Arachne, who uh, and she was uh, besotted by spiders and spider silk. I won't go into those details. But there's not just spiders. You can see spiders here. Scorpions are arachnids. Um, these animals are called sun spiders or camel spiders. They, in fact, don't occur in Australia. They occur in desert systems all over the rest of the world, but unfortunately not in Australia. And, in fact, uh, a few years ago when the Americans uh, went into Iraq, we were peppered with photographs taken by the US military of these great big animals. They've got leg spreads like this, some of the really big ones, and they're holding them up and they're obviously terrified and they're pointing guns at them and all sorts of things. Um, and they look larger than they did just because the way they were taking the photographs, they looked enormous. So we got sent lots of emails saying, what's this, what's this, the US military in trouble. But in fact, it's these wonderful desert-loving animals called sun spiders. Mites and ticks belong to probably the biggest group of not only arachnids, um, of any group of arachnids, but also of any group of animals in the world. So they talk about the numbers of described species of beetles being enormous. Once we get through all of the mites and the ticks in the world, they're probably going to outnumber um, beetles in diversity. And when I mean outnumber them, we're talking somewhere between one and two million species of mites in the world. At the moment, there's only about 50 or 60,000 described. So the mite people have got just a little bit more work to do. I mostly work on a group of arachnids called pseudoscorpions. Now, they're called pseudoscorpions because they look a bit like a scorpion because they've got big nippers at the front, but they don't have the long tail and the sting that scorpions have. And they're quite small. And as um, Lynn Beasley very kindly introduced me in saying that I do work on behalf of and, and uh, advising mining companies on where and where they can't place mines, these are one of the groups that we study um, because you get a lot of species that are found on isolated uh, hilltops or they might occur in underground subterranean environments in limestone areas. So this is my speciality. Whip spiders are these amazing arachnids with great big spiny claws at the front of the body which they use to catch and impale their prey. A great big long pair of front legs which you actually can't see in this image but you might be able to see this, this filament-like structure here. It's actually the first pair of legs and they use them like an insect's antennae. So when they're going up to some um, another uh, member of their species or looking for food, they'll stretch these out right in front of their body and they'll just tap the environment looking for something. Once they find a bit of food, they just coax them in with their pedipalps, with these feelers, sorry, not with the pedipalp, first pair of legs, closer, 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 then they jump on them and all these big spines here are used to crush the prey and then they suck the juices out. <laughs> what a life! Oh, brilliant! Um, this is another group of animals I work a lot on. They're called uh, schizomids or micro whip scorpions. About three years ago, we advised um, one of the mining companies up in the Pilbara that in fact these schizomids had an individual species um, of schizomid living in each of the Mises and the Panawanica region. And it looked at one stage as though um, the presence of this one of these species and a few other things living in these underground environments in this Mesa that Rio Tinto wanted to mine the presence of these species in there looked as though it might was going to hold up the mine. And I haven't got the slide here with me on this particular talk, but I was very, very proud to say that we got front page news in the West Australian, Tiny Spider Stops $11 billion Development. So that's good publicity for the museum. Um, but more importantly, we got the cartoon on page seven or six or whatever it is. So the cartoon was out about one of these little animals. Now I'll Bet 20 bucks there's never been a cartoon in a newspaper about a schizomid anywhere before in the world. So, world first. The other group of arachnids I've got uh, listed here are things called, a, it's called a harvestman or a daddy long legs, a group called the pileones. And uh, you, get, you don't see them around houses all that much in Western Australia. There's an introduced species that you might see in places like Melbourne, um, Canberra and Sydney and the bigger suburbs, but mostly you get them out in, uh, in native bushland areas. So, Arachnids constitute um, this enormous diversity of uh, animals. They're all characterized by mostly, most of them have four pairs of legs. So they have a total of eight legs. They have differing numbers of eyes. Lynn's already mentioned that most spiders have eight eyes. Most scorpions have eight. Pseudoscorpions only have four or two. 
these guys only have two, these guys at most have four. So there's all sorts of variation. But it's the presence of four pairs of legs that really distinguishes them from um, other things like insects, which only have three pairs of legs, or from millipedes and centipedes, which have many, many different pairs of legs. So this is my passion. These are the animals I like studying the most and getting out into the bush to try and discover. Let's see if we can... So quickly, I'll just go through... Um, so my plan today is to talk to you about different kinds of spiders. Um, one of the subtitles of the talk is Spiders, Friends or Foe. Now, by the end of this, you're all, all going to be absolutely convinced, I'm sure, that they're all our friends, that not a single one of them is a foe. Um, but we'll see how we go. I'm, I'm hoping to convince you anyway. But I thought I'd start talking about scorpions because I'm often asked about scorpions. Um, they're quite common in native bushland and um, native uh, settings all over Australia. Uh, there are four different families in Australia. I've got three photographed here. Um, these ones with the tiny, thin little pedipalps. See how these pedipalps here are quite slender? That family is called Boothidae, um, quite common um, in many areas in Western Australia. This is a genus called Eurydacus, which there are a lot, many, many different species. You can see these are two different species here, and you can see the differences in colour patterns and the shape of the tail. Um, and this family is only found up in the tropics. In Western Australia, it's only found in the Kimberley region, of which there's four or five new species that haven't been described yet. There's only about 30 described scorpions in Australia at the moment, but we estimate there's a lot more than a, probably a lot more than 100 species, many, many new species that haven't been scientifically described yet in the literature. So we have a research project going at the Western Australian Museum to do some work on some of these scorpions. Scorpions, I've written here, are moderately toxic. A sting from an Australian scorpion is painful. I should know. It's happened to me. Um, especially these little guys. Um, I've, I've blown this image up so it's bigger than the rest, but these ones are actually smaller than most of the others. These really do pack a punch. Um, I've been stung by one of them, and it, it, it seriously hurt for about 45 minutes. The other ones, less painful. The pain went away after about 10, 15 minutes. It's about, it's about as painful as a bee sting. These guys, this was more painful than a bee sting. I, I can't recommend it, <laughs> to be frank. I was... In all cases, I've been stung by scorpions. It's because I was being stupid. I was handling it with my fingers. I like to think that I can handle a any sort of scorpion with my fingers, but every so often you get stung, so my fault. Um, we hear of very, very few stings from Australian scorpions being presented to hospitals, but when we do, the symptoms are fairly benign. Now, overseas, this family has some very, very toxic members. In South America, there's a genus called Titius, which has probably a couple of hundred species and uh, stings from one or two of those species are, are deadly and probably three, four hundred people a year die from stings of these. In India, there's also another um, genus with a few species that's very toxic. There's one in South Africa called, called Parabuthus, which kills probably about a hundred people a year. In the Middle East, dozens of people are killed. So in other parts of the world, if you're going to pick up a scorpion, don't pick up one of these. Okay, if they've got little thin pedipalps, leave them alone. Very, very dangerous. In Australia, just painful, basically. Um, it, I visited Brazil about three years ago, and there's even a centre for studying scorpion, spider, and snake bites in Sao Paulo. And I was walking across the um, a sort of courtyard area to go and get my lunch one day when I was working at the Institute. And as I was walking past, I thought, what's that noise? And it was a doof, 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 doof. And I got closer and closer. And finally, I looked up. There was a helicopter coming down and about to land where I was walking, and I hadn't realised there was one of those enormous white crosses on the courtyard where they bring the patients from anywhere in the local region that have been stung by scorpions or bitten by snakes, and they were delivering a patient to this place where they do all the work and treat the patients, and I was going over to get my lunch, and so I saw this chopper coming in. It's bloody hell. <laughs> Took off. So, so, yeah, it's really serious stuff in places like Brazil. Now, let's get on to spiders. Now, essentially what I'm going to try and do is talk you through the main differences between different groups of spiders. So when you walk out of this lecture, you can go home and amaze your friends and your relatives and you'll be able to tell them, Mark Harvey told me that there are three groups of spiders and hopefully you'll remember how to distinguish them from each other. Um, so these three groups, they're called mesotheles, mygalomorph spiders and araneomorphs and I'll go into the details in a second. So 
this tree is basically to show a phylogenetic tree of how spiders are thought to have evolved. Now we're looking down at this end of the, of the tree. You're looking at time going back here. So this is now. This is 10 million years ago, 20 million years ago, 30 million years ago, all the way back to here. Spiders are about 300, 350 million years old. There's even a spinneret, one of those things on the back end of a spider which they use to spin silk, which comes from the Devonian, which is about 380 million years old. That's how long spiders have been around. In fact, all of those arachnid groups I showed you on that first slide, they basically all have a fossil record that goes back to the Devonian. These things are the most amazing survivors. They've watched things like the dinosaurs come, and they've watched the dinosaurs go and thought, well, that was a bit of a crazy experiment. That'll never last. But the spiders and their relatives have been here ever since. So this is like a, a phylogenetic tree. This is the ancient spiders. These mesotheles, which I'll talk about next, are the most primitive spiders. They look most like those spiders that would have been around 300 million years ago. Then later on, they diverged into two different groups, mygalomorphs, which I'll talk about, and araniomorphs. Okay, so there are your three groups of spiders. Now, this first group are called mesotheli. Now, they're called mesotheles. Meso means in the middle, and theli means spinnerets, which are the things that spiders use to spin silk from. And the reason they're called mesotheli is because they're on the, the middle of the abdomen. I'm pointing to the middle of my stomach here, which is not very representative. But if you turn the spider over, they're in the middle. In most other spiders, the spinnerets are at the tip. And in some of them, as you'll see in some of the slides, you can see the spinnerets sticking out the back. So the most amazing thing about these spiders is that they still have these plates on the abdomen. Now, if you remember from the photographs I showed just before of the scorpions and the pseudoscorpions and the whip spiders, they all had these plates. But if you think about modern spiders, none of them have plates. They've got a soft, squidgy abdomen, which means that if you're into killing spiders by popping them, that's the thing that happens first. <laughs> goes everywhere. But these guys still have these plates. It's a very, very primitive character. Now, luckily for us, these animals are still alive today, um, and they occur in the jungles and rainforests of Southeast Asia. They go up to Japan and China and come all the way down to Sumatra and about as far west as um, Burma um, and, and Thailand. So these are the most amazing spiders. And they spin, uh, they dig a burrow with the most amazing lid. Now, I took this photograph in Malaysia. I did three weeks of field work in Malaysia last year. And there are places where you can still find these spiders. And you can find them on, mostly on road cuttings. So you just have to walk along. It's a little bit hazardous in Malaysia. Some very, very big trucks and some very, very crazy drivers. So you've actually got to hug the, the bank. If you hear a truck coming, the best thing is to jump into the jungle. Um, but these... These burrow lids are quite big. This is the, this is the lens of my, my camera, which is like an SLR camera. So it's quite big. And they've got these radiating trip lines of silk coming out here. And what they do at night is sit at the entrance of the burrows with four of their eight feet touching these silk lines here. One, two, three. So they might touch four of them. And they wait for something to walk past so that they can grab and pull it into their burrow and eat. So what do you think they eat, kids? What do you reckon they eat? Yeah? I think they eat beetles that walk past at night. Beetles? Ah. I, yeah, fly. I actually think they eat naughty children. Do you, do you think they... Oh, the beetle. You're absolutely right. They do feed on beetles and flies. Anything of a smallish size that walks past that they can grab, they grab it with their big fangs, drag it back into the burrow, chew it up into small pieces, suck all the juices out, and then spit it out. All spiders feed like that. They scrunch things up and they suck it out. I used to do it as a kid with an orange. You ever get an orange and just cut a little hole in it and then squish it up and then suck all the juices out so I didn't have to eat the pulp? And then my mother comes, what are you doing? Eat it properly, naughty boy. Um, and so that's exactly what they do, and they, they spit the rest of the beetle out afterwards. So these are still, in some places, you can still find them. The tragedy about these spiders is that the pet lovers in Europe and North America absolutely adore these spiders, and collectors will come and strip a hillside, strip a road cutting in a couple of days. They're very, very easy to dig out. 
The burrows are often quite shallow. This is very friable soil, um, which means it just breaks up easily in your hands. You can get them out of their burrows really quickly. In fact, all you've got to do is poke a little twig down and they don't like it and they'll jump out and you can hold a net in front of the burrow and they'll jump into it. We were taken back to a site um, by my Malaysian researcher that I was travelling with that he had been looking at these spiders for a few years going back and just counting the numbers of burrows and he hadn't been there for about three years. It was up in the, high up in the mountains and when we got there he nearly cried because we could only find one burrow where previously there were hundreds and this, this means that a collector has come through, grabbed as many as they can, they put them in their suitcase and they take them back to Europe or to the USA and they sell them through the pet trade. Now we're starting a research project with the Malaysians to try and um, counter this. They're doing a lot more checking of baggage um, when people are leaving Malaysia, um, leaving the country to try and find these illegal exports and we're going to start some um, DNA barcoding, some fingerprinting to try and get an idea of if they do take them from the wild, where they're coming from. So that's a project we're hoping to start shortly. These are the most amazing spiders. I was just so pleased to be able to see them um, in the wild. Now, let's move on to the other two groups of spiders. They're big names, mygalomorph spiders and araniomorph spiders. Mygalomorph spiders include all of the trapdoor spiders. So things like funnel web spiders, trapdoor spiders, um, whistling spiders, tarantulas. And araniomorph spiders include all the other spiders. So redback spiders and huntsmans and orb weaving spiders and everything else you can think of, some daddy long legs. Now these crazy looking arrows here are designed to point out to you that one of the main ways that you can tell these apart, especially when they're alive, is by the direction that their fangs move when they bite. So these spiders, my gallimorph spiders, have their two fangs like this and the fangs actually are parallel to each other. So when they bite, they strike down like this. Now normally at this stage in my talks, what I get people to do is to all do this with their fangs. And then these ones, the fangs go inwards like this. Now, you're my audience, there's no exception, you all have to do it, okay? So, okay kids, you're gonna join me? So these ones, which way do they go? Do you remember? This way. So go strike down like that, and then the other ones, ready, ready, ready? Cross like that. Very good, Professor Beasley, very good indeed. <laughs> so, now, because this is the way they bite, it means that these guys have to do a certain number of things to actually be able to get their fangs into whatever they want to bite. And they normally just want to bite um, their food, which once again is beetles, cockroaches, other spiders, small horses, naughty children, those things. But these guys have to bite their fangs across this way. These ones can only clear enough space to bite down by lifting the front part of the body off the ground, okay? So you'll often see trapdoor spiders or funnel web spiders where they've got their legs up off the ground and they're looking threatening. They look, they look horrible, they look prehistoric and people run away from them. They lift themselves off the ground, A, to make themselves look bigger, but B, so they've cleared enough space for their fangs to come down and bite your leg. Well, not your leg, but just generally anybody's leg. So they have to bite down. These guys don't have to do that. They can just walk up to something and go, I've bitten you. So what we think about spider evolution is that when the change happened from this type of fang, where you had to lift yourself up and you had to brace yourself on something, like on the ground, to this kind of fang, where you didn't have to brace yourself on much at all, and you just have to bite this way and you've killed something, is that it allowed this group of spiders to do all sorts of amazing things. These ones all essentially just live on the ground and haven't changed much for millions of years. These guys have diversified into lots and lots of different types of spiders with lots and lots of different sorts of biology. So they spin different sorts of webs. You think of orb weaving spiders, okay, with that big spill silken web that they spin at night. They can then walk up to the prey that gets caught in that and just pinch it and kill it. One of these guys, if it was in one of those webs, it's got nothing to brace against nothing to lift up and strike down against. So did anybody see the movie Arachnophobia about 10, 15 years ago? I love that movie, it was so funny. They had one of these in an orb web. So of course all the arachnologists around the world, oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> I want my money back now. It's clearly, clearly it's a work of fiction. So this was one of the great changes in the evolution of spiders. And it's thought to coincide with, it happened at the same time this sort of development of this type of lifestyle 
with area, what we call aerial webs where they catch, started catching flying insects. It happened at the same time that insects evolved wings. They happened together. So there was like an evolutionary arms race between spiders trying to catch insects and ex insects flying and probably trying to get away from spiders. So it's amazing. You can see all of this in the fossil record. Now, now let's get back to trapdoor spiders. Now, we use, I use the word, the expression trapdoor spiders in Western Australia to cover a large range of different spiders. Not all of them have a trapdoor lid, and that's what I referred to. I'll show you some shots in a second. But I use it because one of the most common public inquiries we receive at the museum is somebody finds a trapdoor spider, they look on the web, or in, in 10 years ago they'd look up a book, they look through, they find a picture of a funnel web, it looks the same, and so they ring up and say, oh, we found the first funnel web spider in Western Australia. And I, would, I have answered this public inquiry so many times, I, could probably, I probably have done it in my sleep, actually. I've probably muttered it in my sleep. Um, funnel web spiders have never, ever been found in Western Australia. So I use the expression trapdoor spider to cover all of the things um, that look a bit like them. And I'll show you some shortly. They're an enormous group of animals. At the moment, there's probably only a few hundred species described in Western Australia, but some genera contain over 100 new species. There's one genus we know of that's got one named species in Western Australia. And Bar Dr. Barbara Main, who works at the University of Western Australia, estimates there's at least 100 new species in Western Australia. So I say to her, why aren't you working harder? Work on weekends, describe those species. It's a, it's a huge amount of work to get all of that done. Some species are very, very scarce. Some trapdoor spiders are on Western Australia's threatened species list because they're only found in small fragmented areas. They might have occurred in, um, in the wheat belt, which has been largely um, deforested and cleared. Uh, they might occur in, on hilltops, on the Stirling Ranges, for example. And so we, we keep them on the threatened species list to try and monitor the populations and make sure they don't become extinct. Now, this is a, uh, a typical trapdoor spider lid that you might see in Western Australia in, in some of the semi-arid and heathland areas. They make, a, they make this lid. It's basically silk that they spin out of their spinnerets. It's all matted together. And they put bits of dirt and things on it to camouflage it. Um, there's the rim just there. And these guys, a bit like our friend Lephistius in Southeast Asia, will make radiating lines. But instead of out of silk, she actually, and I say she because most of the ones we see are actually female, she makes, gets little twigs and lines them up and that's the little triggering mechanism at night. She does the same thing that uh, Lephistius does. She'll sit at the entrance with her feet waiting for something to walk past. You know, naughty children. It's a good joke, but it's an old one. And so as soon as they walk past and they, um, they trigger the um, uh, walk across the twigs, she'll rush out and grab them pull them into the burrow, munch them up and eat them. Okay, so can anybody see the trapdoor spider lid in that photograph? Okay, how about this? Uh, look at that. They're really hard to see. Really hard to see. This was taken down near Arthur River on the halfway to Albany. And to get your eye in to work out where they are in an area like this, I'm not, I'm not very good at it. Barbara Main's incredible. She can walk around and find them. I walk around blindly, just get a sore back. But, um, but that, that's uh, what happens when you open them up. So most amazing. And the burrows are sometimes quite deep. They can be sort of a good, good 30, 40, sometimes centimetres, sometimes even deeper. So you wouldn't want to dig them out too often. What's the next one? Um, so there's lots of different types of trapdoor spiders in Western Australia. They come in all different sorts of shapes and sizes. There's great big ones. There's tiny little ones. There's brown ones. This one's from up in the uh, Shark Bay area. Um, there's, this is a female of a big, thick, black, hairy one that is, in fact, quite common all, over, all through the wheat belt. And this one's actually got a series of little mites that live at the back of the head here and they feed on small things that might be in like little food items that she hasn't eaten um, in, their, in their burrows. We, come, we sometimes have these guys brought into us at the museum. People might be um, backhoeing a trench or digging up in their backyard or something and they find this, think it's a funnel web, bring it into the museum 
Um, and, and it's a shame. I try and get people to go and release them, especially the females when they're brought in, because there's really good evidence that these females might live to be at least about 40 years old. So I've had this, had this motto in my life, never kill something that's older than me. Well, it's getting harder now as I'm getting a lot <laughs> older, of course. But, you know, it's really sad too because we do have an enormous preserved collection of spiders at the museum, which we do our, our research on. But to have to kill something that that's, uh, is that old, I don't like doing. I don't think it's right to actually just go and release it somewhere where it wasn't from in the first place. So I try and encourage people to take them back and release them. Not just let them go because a bird or something will come and feed on them straight away, but to use a broom handle, make a hole in the ground, cover it with a bit of twigs or something and pop, pop her down the hole, cover it up. Hopefully she'll, uh, she'll dig a, spin a new web and, and a new lid, which they do quite easily. These are, um, I haven't got sort of scales on this, but this one, this one's, this one's pretty big. Can you, do you want to come and help me show how, can you come and help me? What's your name? Katie. Katie, fantastic. Can you come here, can you stand here? You and I are going to show the audience how big this spider is. Can you stand here? Can you put your hand up like that for me? Like that? Okay. This one is about, it's about, it's really big. It's about, <laughs> no, hang on. No, I just can't quite. No, no, it's about that big. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katie. Okay, so these are amongst the biggest spiders we have in Australia. Leg span, they cover a sort of a teacup plate size. Um, pretty big, pretty scary. Wouldn't want one in your tent at night. Um, but they don't occur really near Perth. They're more out in the red sand area, so they're quite common around places like Kalgoorlie. And they go all the way up to the Kimberley. The entire, every single species in Western Australia is, is undescribed. It's a new species. We have a colleague in Brisbane who's working on them. And this is a fantastic photograph showing you the long spinnerets at the back of the body which they use to spin silk. So this is where all the silk comes from, the back of the body. So that's our local version of a tarantula. Um, it's, there are some, this is a female and this is the male of the same species. The female has much shorter legs and is fairly um, sort of uniformly coloured. This is the male. The male of this species has these amazing silvery hairs over the, the head and the abdomen to give them this wonderful contrasting appearance. They're amazing spiders. This is, um, this is a mouse spider, a male of a mouse spider. Um, it's got a bluish tinge on the abdomen. They've also got a reddish tinge, sometimes bright red, on the head and on the fangs. And these guys actually walk around in the middle of the day. So during autumn, the males come out in autumn looking for females to mate with. And um, we often get phone calls. I've had phone calls of people ringing up saying, I've got one walking up my driveway. What am I going to do? And I say, well, go and take a photograph. They're fantastic. So um, this is a type of spider that I would not like to be bitten by in Western Australia. I think they would be very, very painful and possibly very, very toxic. And occasionally, we have inquiries about these spiders um, concerning the numbers of legs. And what I've written up here is eight legs or ten. If you actually count the legs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This front pair here look like an extra pair of legs. I actually had a guy ring up from a hotel one day and they'd obviously had way too many pints of beer that day. Uh, they'd been parked all afternoon and he was convinced that they'd found one out in the car park of the hotel, a spider with ten legs. And he knew full well that spiders didn't have ten legs. So I was trying to convince him that in fact it's one of these spiders and that this thing is actually the pedipalp. Now a pedipalp in, in arachnids is the, the claws in a scorpion are the pedipalps. And in female spiders, they're generally quite short, they're only about this long, and they're used just to help get the food into the mouth. In males, it's modified to, so that the male can mate with the female. So you see this little pointy structure on the end of the, the spider's palp here. He fills that with sperm, courts with the female, and then injects the sperm into the female using these things called pedipalps. Now, in mouse spiders, they just hap happen to be very, very long, nearly as long as the, as the legs. And that's why people sometimes think that there's ten, ten legs, not eight. Um, yeah, so this guy, this poor guy, I was trying to, trying to see if I could bet him money that it had eight legs, but no, he wasn't into that. He wasn't that drunk. So, um, so we get these inquiries occasionally. Now, I'll get back to funnel web spiders. One of the main distinguishing features of male funnel web spiders is that they all have 
um, a spur or a process on the second pair of legs. In Western Australia, the only male spiders that have processes, some of them don't have anything at all, but if they do have a process, it's on the first pair of legs. Okay, so it's the easiest way to tell funnel webs from trapdoor spiders if you have a male and if you can get close enough to the spider to see spurs. Now in this one, the spur is more just like a little concavity, but there is something there when you look at it. So people often then count the pedipalps. They say, oh, there's the first pair of legs. There's the second pair of legs. Um, I can see a spur. And I say, no, 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 count from the back end of the body. Fourth pair of legs, third pair of legs, second pair of legs. And in all cases, people say, oh, yes, you're right, the spur's on the first pair of legs. We've never seen a funnel web in Western Australia. There are lots of different species. There's about sort of 40 or 50 different species from South Australia up to Queensland. There's even one up in the wet tropics. And unfortunately, the most toxic species of the funnel web spiders um, has a relatively small distribution. But we happen to plonk Sydney, which is our biggest city of about four and a half million people, dead smack in the middle of the distribution of possibly the world's deadliest spider. So now if you just measure that, they're very happy to live in Perth. Very happy, long way away. Um, and one of the spiders that I've been working on um, for the last oh, 10 years or so has been a group of spiders that occur in the Stirling Ranges and the Prongrups and elsewhere in the southwest. And they turn out, the genus called Mugridgia, they turn out to be these ancient survivors that we've looked at their DNA and their relationships um, and their, their, the lineages are very, very old. The males and females don't walk very far, so it looks as though many species have evolved over time. And they're quite hard to see. Um, you, can, you can make it. This is my hat. <laughs> it's my old hat. It fell apart last year. It's a tragedy. You can see these little holes here. These are the old burrow entrances in a piece of clay at the base of a marry tree in the Stirling Ranges. And you can see where they used to be. To find the burrows, um, the, the living ones in this clay is very, very hard. They're very well camouflaged. This is one under a piece of carry bark. And um, there's, the, there's the, the lid, the entrance to the burrow. And there's her burrow just there. You've really got to um, get your eye in to be able to find them. So they're just about my favorite spiders. Now, let's get on to a few of the Uraniumorph spiders. So redback spiders are probably Western Australia's most toxic spider. There's no doubt about it. So a bite um, is very, very common because the spiders are very common. I guarantee that every single one of you have got at least one in your backyard right now. I, I walked um, through, I live in Mount Hawthorne, I walked through the shopping centre the other day to just up, up uh, Scarborough Beach Road and every so often I just count redback spider webs because well, it passes the time of day. And it was only a distance of about 70 metres, and I counted 20 different redback spider webs. And I'm pretty certain that most of them have got active spiders in them, although the webs being very distinctive, they are very sort of hard wearing, and um, they do hang around for a long time, even after the spider is dead. The uh, female has a bright black or jet black uh, body and legs with this uh, red stripe, sometimes it's orangey in color. The egg sac is about the size of a large pea and is this creamy colored, often there's more than one. And there could be well over 100 eggs inside each of those egg sacs. So when they come out, lots of little babies go everywhere. A bite from one of these guys is very toxic, but luckily the venom is very, very slow acting and fatalities are very rare. In fact, we're, we're not sh we, we think there's been no fatalities uh, from redback spider bites in Australia since an antivenine was developed in the late 1950s. In most cases where people are hospitalized, and that's several hundred people a year in Australia, in most cases um, the medical staff just keep people under observation. They um, don't um, give them any medication. They don't give them an antivenine because you can work it through yourself. You can get rid of the, the toxins. Um, every so often they do have to give an antivenine because people are reacting to it quite badly. If you have been bitten by one of these things, um, the best way to know whether it was a redback or not is at the site, if you haven't seen the spider for example, is at the place where you've been bitten. Um, it, there's perspiration builds up, so the bite site, just the size of a five cent piece, will sweat 
So it's literally just beads of perspiration. And that distinguishes redback spider bites from nearly all other different types of spider bites. So they're the most, probably the most common spider. And their distribution, they probably um, weren't native to Western Australia before Europeans started moving stuff around. They're great travellers. They'll, they'll kick around in the back of a car or on, on, in a box and be moved from place to place. They're the first spiders, I think, that turn up on building sites, on clean building sites. Brickies will bring in bricks and timber and whatever else they'll need. And there's occasionally a redback spider amongst them as well. Now, wolf spiders are very, very common, especially at night. They only hunt at night. They're called wolf spiders because they tend not to make any silken snare in which they catch their prey, and they run their prey down, just like wolves do. They do it by themselves, though. They don't do it in packs. And the characteristic thing about wolf spiders is that they have, apart from the four small eyes at the front of the head, they have four very large eyes on the top of the head, arranged in a square. And you can see one, two, three, four... Uh, one, two, and over the back, three, four. A little bit hard to see. One, two, three, four. So it's arranged in this pattern. And they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Some of them are beautiful, creamy, yellowy, with contrasting black. <coughs> Others have these, what's called a union jack pattern, where they have radiating lines on, on the top of the head. Excuse me. This one <coughs> lives on beaches, so it's very, very pale in coloration. Uh, others live on, on salt lakes out in the goldfields area. There's lots of different species. Now, the best way to look at a wolf spider is to go out at night. If you've got a patch of lawn or you've got a local um, parkland area, grass is a great place to do it on. Get a head torch and pop it on. Or if you haven't got a head torch, use a torch. But you have to have the torch up near your eyes. Don't hold it down here. It's got to be up near your eyes. And just walk around and just shine your light on the grass. And if you see little diamond-coloured sort of pale reflections coming back at you, I guarantee it's a wolf spider. Occasionally you might pick up a tiny little bit of glass which will reflect, but they're normally wolf spiders. And keep your eye on it and you walk straight up to the spider and even the tiny little ones you can see because they're reflecting that light. And if you know of anybody who doesn't like spiders and you want to completely and utterly upset them, take them outside with a torch and show them how many wolf spiders you've got in your backyard because they'll keel over. Okay, so wolf spiders are very, very common, but very easily seen and very easily observed at night. Some of them, like this one, even build a little trapdoor lid like our trapdoor spider friends. And so sometimes you think you've got one and all of a sudden it's gone and finally you get up to the spot where you saw the reflection and there's a little silk, silken lid that they use and they pull it down and pull the lid shut like this and hope you'll go away. So that's mostly these lovely coloured spiders here. Um, and wolf spiders show um, one of the most amazing behaviours. This is an adult female, again, down in the Stirling Ranges. And <coughs> when the babies hatch out of the egg sac, they hatch out and climb onto mum's back and will stay there for a week or two before they disperse and leave mother. And so I remember one of my earliest memories of a spider as a child was growing up in, in a suburban Melbourne in my backyard um, and looking at a spider on my hands and knees and I, I must have exhaled, exhaled sort of strongly. And all these little spiders just went, and they just all took off. And I thought, I thought she'd exploded. I was into guns and aeroplanes and things. And I thought, whoa, she's, expl she's exploded. And, and she then wandered off. I thought, well, she hasn't exploded. And I watched. And what was happening was that these spiders, they take off from mum, but they leave a little trail of silk behind so they can find mum again. And then after about five minutes, they all started coming back and getting onto mum's um, onto her back and she took off probably because my breath was terrible. So. Now, huntsman spiders are also very common around houses. This is one that I was trying to take a photograph of in an, a, like an aquarium that I take photographs of spiders and it crawled out onto, this is the corner of my computer. So I was at one end of the table photographing a spider late one night and my wife was at the other end sort of marking exam papers at university. And I said, uh, don't panic, sweetheart, but there's a, there's a huntsman spider roaming around on the table. But I got this great shot of it actually on the corner of my computer. Now, huntsman spiders tend to be fairly flat. The legs, instead of sort of sticking out this way so they sit up, they tend to splay them out sideways. And this means they can get into small crevices like bark of trees or under rocks. They will come inside houses, occasionally... Females will um, lay an egg sac 
and the babies will hatch. A few times I've seen the results of those hatchings. You'll see literally a couple of hundred of tiny little spiderlings all across the ceiling of a room. Um, and if you don't like spiders, that's a pretty hairy thing to have happen. I lived in a share house when I was at uni years ago and one of my friends I was sharing the house with woke me up at about 3 o'clock in the morning and he said, there's been stuff all night sort of raining on my face and he said, I've turned the light on and there's lots of little spiders. You deal with it. And I said, I said, how about you sleep in the lounge room and we'll deal with it in the morning. I'm not doing it at 3 o'clock in the morning. So they will roam around. The babies take off, leave mum and try and find a life on their own. But huntsman spiders are extremely common. Lots of different species as well. Yeah, a huntsman spider can... Uh, my message is any spider of a decent size, if handled, will bite you. They will defend themselves. Rule number one, don't pick up a spider. Okay? I've never, ever been bitten by a spider. Now, I told you before I've been stung by scorpions through stupidity, but I don't pick up spiders with my fingers. Sometimes I will coax them onto my hand, but if you try and grab them with your fingers, they'll turn around and they'll bite. And so any spider of a decent size can bite and it will be painful, if not from the venom, then just the fact that you've got a pair of pincers going into you. The bigger spiders, it's like a pair of thumbtacks going into you. It's quite painful. So, um, yes, these things will bite. Now, the next huntsman spider I want to talk about is if you've ever been down on the south coast and looked under the rocks, the granite rocks that occur through there in some of the beautiful areas, Two Peoples Bay, um, Fitzgerald River National Park. I have a penchant for rolling rocks and seeing what's on the underside of them. I like looking for tiny little things. I don't like it when I find things like snakes and stuff like that which rush out. But these spiders are quite large. So their legs span like this and the, during this time of the year, late summer through to autumn, the females will actually um, guard an egg sac. The babies will hatch out and they, she will then look after her brood. Now, I've blown this photograph up, so that one's actually bigger than that photograph, but this is meant to signify that she looks after all of these tiny little babies. Now, about three years ago, I was at a conference, and I explained this to somebody from America, from New York, who worked on social behavior of spiders, and I explained this to her, and I had some photographs of mum with the bubs, and she literally, three months later, got on a plane and flew out to Perth, and I took her down to the south coast, and she told me she was... She was in raptures because this was a new study animal. There are only, up until then, I think there were only 21 social species of spiders in the world. And that's very rare in a predator where they like to eat each other. Social spiders, the females and will tolerate their young and often tolerate each other. And she was beside herself because this was the 22nd social spider species in the world. And she was going to start a whole new study program on this and she got permits from DEC and she exported specimens back to New York. She's got a colony of our, our Australian spiders, which are the 22nd social spider species in the world. Um, so be careful of these guys. If you are going to roll rocks on the south coast, they run very, very quickly, and I have had them run up my trouser legs, <laughs> which means you've got to drop your trousers to get rid of them. So. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about spiders, probably the first spider that comes into your mind are types of orb-weaving spiders. There are lots of different types of orb-weavers. I don't have enough time to go into all of them. The most common one we have in our backyard um, is a spider called, it's got a scientific name, Eriophora. It's a garden orb-weaving spider. And sometimes they have these amazing white stripes down their back. And taxonomists, people who study different species of animals, used to classify different species of, of uh, sorry, orb-weaving spiders based on the size and the shape and the presence of this stripe. Now, it turns out that this stripe is just basically a, um, uh, crystals of guanine deposited under the skin. It means nothing in terms of distinguishing different species, um, but they do sometimes come in without them, with them, and sometimes with a cross. I actually had a public inquiry once where somebody said that told me on the phone that the Lord has returned. I said, I, I, I beg your pardon? I said, Jesus is in my backyard. I said, well, I think you've got the wrong department here. This is the spider section. And she eventually, I got it out of her. But because it had a cross on its back, she thought it was a crucifix, and she was convinced that Jesus had returned in the shape of a spider. It took me a long time to end that telephone call politely. So um, the other type of... And these spiders are, are amazing because they spin, they mostly spin their webs at dusk. 
they sit there in the middle of the web all night waiting for insects to fly in and they eat the insects. Um, then in the morning, she'll go round and completely eat the entire web again. Ingest all of the nutrients, sit curled up in a little spot during the day, hoping the birds don't find her. And then that night, she'll spin another web again. You'll see them right now. This time of the year is perfect. I've got a, we've got a big one outside our back door. So my kids and I have been out every night watching her spin this, this uh, web. It takes about half an hour, 40 minutes. It's absolutely amazing. Spend the time, do it. It's, and remember that spiders just like this were doing this about 150 million years ago. So this is a behavior that's lasted for a really long time. Just fantastic. Now the other common group of orb-weaving spiders you might see is Nephila, the golden orb-weaving spider. We call them golden orb weaving spider because you, can, you might just be able to make out the web's actually got a yellowish tinge to it. And in contrast to these spiders, these guys actually leave them up all the time. You tend not to see them in the suburbs very often. Every so often on rot nests, the numbers build up a lot and you see a lot, then they crash again for some reason. But if you've ever walked into one or ridden your, a motorcycle or a bicycle through them, you'll know all about them. Phenomenally tough silk, it's really strong. Now. This is the adult female. She's legs and all. She'd be about this size. This is the male up here. Okay? He's absolutely tiny. So when they do mate, I'm convinced the female does know what's going on, but maybe only just a little bit. But she, um, she allows him to mate, comes down the web and on gentle openings on the other side. So he's, often you'll find two or three males in the same web fighting each other for access to the female. Now, Probably the, th the one public inquiry that's cost me more time over the last 30 years than anything else has been white-tailed spiders. White-tailed spiders are very, very common in houses. They're long and slender. They have this white spot at the back of the abdomen. And to cut a very, very long story short, um, about 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 30 years ago when I was a postgraduate student at Monash, um, uh, a medical researcher claimed that these spiders, a bite from one, would cause a necrosis, skin death, which could eventually um, rot your skin away all the way down to the bone. Okay? And so there was a huge scare, a media favourite. I don't know how many times I've spoken to television reporters, print reporters, radio reporters, trying to kill this story. There was a, a survey done of bites from these spiders um, about seven or eight years ago, and not only did all of the symptoms of definite bites from these spiders turn out to cause nothing more than an ulcer the size of about a five or a ten cent piece, which a lot of spiders can do. Um, he also found that there were a couple of hundred reported white-tailed spider bites in the Darwin region, top of Australia, um, each year that doctors are diagnosed as white-tailed spider bites. White-tailed spiders do not occur within about 1,200 kilometres of Darwin. So what doctors turned out to be diagnosing were um, midge bites, flea bites, skin cancers, fungal infections, bacterial infections, um, all sorts of different things, but they weren't white-tailed spiders. So I wouldn't like to be bitten by one. If you find one inside your house, um, toss it outside. That's what we do. I don't like them. They, they will walk up walls, walk across ceilings. They occasionally get into bedding. They occasionally get into clothing if you leave it on the floor overnight, which of course none of you do. Well, I do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, in some suburbs they're very common. Black house spiders are probably on the outside of every house in Western Australia as well. I haven't got a picture of a spider, but this is a picture of the funnel. And occasionally we get public inquiries. People think they've got funnel web spiders up on their pergola. It's a totally different group of spiders altogether. You've seen the web. Most people hate them because it's, it's messy and untidy. We tolerate them until they get too big because their, their web can end up enormous. They do catch moths and flying insects, so we, we leave them up outside. I was actually at a meeting on about the, it must have been about the 15th or, no, higher than that, maybe the 30th floor of a building in the city before Christmas, and I was sitting at the meeting waiting for it to start, and the building was sort of like this, and this is the outside, and we were sitting here. And I saw a web of one of these on the outside of the building in the city at about the 30th or 40th floor. So they're, they're, they're amazing where they'll get to. Hello. Oh. Now, some of the other projects that we're involved in, just very quickly. Um, this is a group of spiders that are only known from Australia. 
Madagascar, and South Africa. But they were first described in the 1800s from amber fossils, about 30 million years old, um, from Europe. They were first described as fossils, then found alive in Madagascar, then in South Africa, then in Australia. We've got a large research project going on at the museum with Michael Ricks and myself. And at the moment, there's about five species named from Australia. And poor old Mike's discovered about 50 or 60 new species. So he's got a huge amount of work over the next two and a half years yet uh, to complete this project. Fantastic looking animals. We call them assassin spiders because they actually only feed on other spiders. And they use their really long fangs. These are the long fangs here. They walk up to a spider. They walk up behind it. They touch it on the back. <laughs> and then they use their long fangs to impale the spider. Okay? And then feed on them. Most amazing animals, very, very small. We're very fortunate. There's some really good populations down near Albany. The Albany wind farm is full of assassin spiders all in that bush around it. Um, I particularly like look, working on tiny spiders. Um, a project we have going at the moment on goblin spiders um, is funded by the National Science Foundation in the USA. It's a, um, a huge group of researchers all around the world. There's about 30 of us doing this project. And we hope to describe... At the moment, there's about four or 500 goblin spiders described from around the world. And we hope to describe about 2,500 new species during the life of this project. So these are a couple of examples here. PhD student who's based at the museum at the University of Western Australia, Karen Edward, is working on this genus. This is a genus for which there's not a single named Australian species. Yet, like Mike, she's got about 60 or 70 new species from Queensland, New South Wales, the Northern Territory, and the Kimberley. So it, there's just the, the levels of biodiversity in spiders is just is kind of untapped at the moment. We're just starting to get a handle on it. This is another spider where there's only three named species in Australia. Once again, 40 or 50 new species. And some of them are very, very common. Mark, the thing to me about that one, it looks as if, if you touched it, the, the abdomen would drop off. This one here? Yeah. yeah, it's connected by this little thing called the pedicel. I don't know how they hold it together. But it means that they can sort of move their body around as well and flex it. So this one's not looking so good because it's been in ethanol and Karen's taken the legs off the DNA. But uh, <laughs> it's, looking, it's looking, a bit, looking a bit sad. Yeah. Now, we've also done a lot of work in subterranean environments or cave, cave spiders. This is a big one that was described during the 90s. It's got a leg span of about this big, small body in the middle, completely blind. And the numbers of spiders that are turning up in all sorts of areas in Western Australia um, are remarkable, blind spiders. Not just in caves. Caves are typically spaces that we can walk into. You can abseil or get a ladder and walk into them. We find a lot of blind spiders from environments where there's spaces below the ground, but we can't get to them. And colleagues of mine, colleague of mine at the Western Australian Museum, Bill Humphreys, he's worked out a way of sampling these spiders by using boreholes at the mining companies or the water detection people might drill. You put a trap down um, with leaf litter that the spiders move in and other things move into over time. Go back in a few weeks' time, pull it up, look through it, pull your spiders out. And there's large numbers of new spiders um, turning up. And we're, we're doing a lot of work on behalf of the mining companies who, as Lynn said in her introduction, they want and we want to make sure that by processing or starting a new mine, a spider or something else isn't sent to extinction because the entire habitat for a species is, is dug up, put on a ship and sent off to China so it comes back to us as cars and paper clips. Um, we have to make sure that there's some environment left where each of these species can still survive. So, so every day or just about every week we're seeing things we've never seen before. Now, to summarise, are spiders friends or foes? Yes or no? F who says friends? Uh, who says foes? Yes. My work here is done. Okay, now remember, most spiders have venom glands. There are some that actually don't have venom glands. As I said before, most large spiders can bite humans. There are very few spiders with toxic venom. So in most cases, if you're bitten, it's painful, but the pain wears off fairly quickly. And spiders are very important regulators of insect populations all over the world. It's been estimated, it was estimated in the 1950s, that if every spider tomorrow dropped dead, then within a year, we'd be knee-deep in insects around the world. Now, I don't know whether that's really true, but by goodness, it sounds good, doesn't it? So spiders do feed on large numbers of insects. Even in areas like rice paddies in Southeast Asia, there's a big move from using 
insecticides and pesticides to control insects, pests in them, to actually stop doing all of that, allowing the spiders to come back in and allowing the spiders to try and regulate the insects as much as they can. The insects are still eating some of the crop, but the benefit for the farmer is that they have an organic crop that they can sell if they wish to organically, which gets a higher price, but also they're not having to pay for those chemicals in the first place. So ultimately they're better off. And the way that they're better off are our spider friends. The spiders are the ones who are trying to control those insect pests. So I've um, also, I'm often asked by people about, you know, what's, what are the most dangerous animals? Actually, when I do school groups, I ask, so what's the most dangerous animal in Australia? And I expect people to say um, <coughs> sharks or dogs or, or snakes or spiders. And in fact, most, most children are very smart. They'll say, human beings are, oh, Mr. Harvey. I say, yes, that's true, apart from human beings. So what I've got here is a little montage of really some of the things that do kill a lot of people. And I've just spent the last few days trying to get some statistics. Now, as far as I can work out in Australia, <coughs> snakes, dogs, possibly spiders, there's several thousand bites or attacks every year. Very few are really bad, um, although a lot of dog bites are quite bad. Snake bites, people are hospitalised. But fatality rates are quite low. Normally, there's only one or one and two. Sharks, it's less than one or about one on average in Australia every year. So over a long time period. Now, of course, a sh every time there's a shark attack or every time there's a spider fatality. In fact, a few days ago, there was a funnel web spider bite, I think, in New South Wales or Queensland. So it gets front page news. These are the sorts of animals that people don't like. They're newsworthy. We have an instinctive fear of things like sharks. I do. I don't like them. <laughs> um, and a lot of people have a what seems to be an instinctive or a learned fear of spiders as well. But in reality, as they say, you're more likely being injured or killed driving to the beach than being killed by a shark. Now, the interesting thing is that bees and wasps and ants possibly kill many more people than these other animals I've just talked about every year. And that's largely as totally due to anaphylactic shock. You develop an allergic reaction over time to things like bees and wasps and even ants, like bulldog ants, jump, jack jumpers in Tasmania in particular. And they're very, they can be very, very fatal. And yet, we don't have this pathological dislike of bees the way that we might do about spiders, which is a bit of a shame. Now, of course, road statistics are the most telling. Um, I had to put bites, et cetera, here because, of course, cars don't bite, but you know what I mean, traffic accidents of which there's quite a high mortality because we're all rushing around like lunatics on the roads. But to put it in perspective, spiders are not particularly dangerous. Um, and this statistic is largely in Australia driven by, uh, you know, one spider fatality every few years, which is very unfortunate, but it is luckily very low. Now, on a, on a sad note, this email has been going around for the last couple of years. Um, somebody's put together an email which has got Red Cross um, banner on the top. Um, this is a new known spider. Take notes. Found in East Australia, heading to WA. The f these emails change. People, people change them. The whole thing's a complete hoax. Okay, the Red Cross knows nothing about it. They've even got a disclaimer on their own website saying this is a load of uh, rubbish. Um, please take note of this spider. It's very dangerous. And the images that go around with it, I should warn you, are not very pleasant. But as far as we can work out, this is not caused by a spider bite. We think, I've been in touch with my colleagues in America, we think that this is caused by a snake bite from Central America, of which there's some very, very nasty snakes that cause these sores. So we even think that these are um, possibly not the same person, okay? That the, the, these ones might be different to these ones and put together in an email with a photograph of this spider, which is called a, a fiddleback spider. Um, which does occur in Central America. It does occur in northern USA, uh, in USA. It doesn't occur in Australia. This species doesn't occur in Australia. So some malicious bill sending this email around. And I get sent this for comment probably once a fortnight for the last two years. So I've got a stock standard reply on my computer. All I have to do is paste it back into the email and press the button. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really horrific, um, but we think that this is caused by um, a snake bite. Nothing to do with spiders whatsoever. 
So the power of the internet is wonderful. Now, my final slide. Our patron for this series of talks is the wonderful Dr. Harry Butler. I recall as a kid growing up as a teenager, watching the television when the program In the Wild came on, and looking back on it, A, I think about how it's so different to many of the natural history programs we see on television now, which are really polished. David Attenborough set the, set the standard. But this man, this man did the first of those sorts of things, really, where he concentrated on the Australian fauna. And it was the most amazing thing. I was absolutely enraptured by the program as a kid. I've been very pleased a few years ago to describe a new species of pseudoscorpion that I worked on, um, which uh, was in this genus called Tyrannocothonius. So we named it Tyrannocothonius butleri. A colleague of mine in, um, in Queensland described a new species from Barrow Island, where Harry's done a lot of work, which he called Cynotheli butleri. We're in the process of describing a new scorpion from Barrow Island, which we'll name for Harry as well. So I'm very, very pleased to be associated with this program, which is named in honour of Dr. Harry Butler. And I'll finish there, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.